Hello, I am Vitold and this one is kind of personal for me as I'm like many of you in the market for a big adventure motorcycle and KTM bikes have been on my radar for a pretty long time and I've spent some time with 1290 Super Adventure R and then the S version. And what I need to tell you is that these two really are two separate motorcycles. It's, it's not the same machine with larger wheels or just with a larger tank as it happens in some other cases and some other manufacturers. These things feel and ride differently. So you absolutely need to know what you are looking at before going to the showroom and picking yours based on what you think you would prefer. And I was close to making that mistake myself. Yet you'll hear and read a lot of crap articles on the internet saying that 1290 Super Adventure S is a street-based motorcycle, street-oriented motorcycle, and the R version is an off-road oriented version. Yes, that is the idea. But it doesn't mean that all of us who mostly ride on pavement should automatically not consider the R. Hell no, I'm saying. So I'm going to tell you what areas are the same and feel the same then what is different and known from the beginning on paper and then about tech and equipment so that you know what both versions include and what possibilities you've got going with either model. Because some things you may only have in the S and some others only in the R and you should know that up front. And the last part will be how it actually feels to ride these bikes. And there you will realize that you may take the catalog all the articles or some articles written based on press releases and specification comparisons and throw them straight into rubbish. I've ridden every single big adventure motorcycle on the market today and can say what I feel based on those experiences. So let's dig into the topic and see how different the S is from the R and which one should suit you better. That's the bottom line here. First of all, both models use the same base frame and engines, yes. So a V2 engine, 1,301 cubic centimeters of displacement with 75 degree angle between the cylinders, which is a little bit unusual as most other V2 setups keep a 90 degree angle. There is 160 horsepower and 138 newton meters of torque. And this is likely the most fun to ride powertrain in the whole class. I have reviewed both versions separately and if you'd like to see detailed tests of them head to the links in the description or in the screen in the end of this video. This is a brilliant engine that I think may win hearts of very very many riders. Out of the core features both have the same brakes with Corning ABS and KTM was, I believe, the first one in the category to introduce Corning ABS. Uh, both versions use chain drive and weigh pretty much the same with only one kilogram difference and the R version being heavier, 221 kilograms dry versus 220 kilograms of the S version dry as well. The fuel tanks are the same and can carry 23 liters of fuel. No difference here. We can establish that they're both around 240 kilograms with fuel and so pretty much the same. And at this point, we know that straight line performance of those motorcycles is the same, but that's not exactly how you feel it, especially at lower speeds when you roll the throttle wide open. And I will explain why that is. Let's head to the suspension, which is where the most of the differences are and they are visible. The first out of the three differences is that the R has larger travel in the front and in the rear. It's 10% more than in the S, from 20 centimeters in S to 22 centimeters in the R. This results in the second difference, which is ground clearance, that is 24.2 centimeters for the R and around two centimeters less in the S, but not fully. It's still larger, 22.4 centimeters. Mind you here, this is more than in BMW R1250 GS Adventure, already in the S, which has 22 centimeters, just like that. But for the record, another BMW F850 GS has 25 centimeters of ground clearance, which is, wow, that's something. Anyhow, both of the KTM versions have a lot with R having really all the clearance that you may probably ever want. And then there's the third difference, which is in components and how the suspension works. In the R, you've got traditional manual adjustment, while every S comes with electronically adjustable semi-active suspension that reacts to what it encounters on the road, depending on the mode that you choose. However, this is not the end, as you may further upgrade this particular system 
and it's worth it. Actually, I wonder why KTM are not installing it as standard since it's like 300 euros option, but it's called a suspension pro for the S only. In the R, there's nothing to add there, but in S, with this pack, you're getting some things unavailable in the R, which are an anti-dive function, which doesn't fully, of course, prevent the bike's front end from diving, but likely up to some point is supposed to reduce it. It's not like in the BMW GS, uh, the 1250, but hopefully KTM keeps working on it. Then there's an option of choosing an automatic preload option and as the third additional thing here come two more suspension modes off-road and auto and as the last fourth addition here there are more adjustment possibilities within suspension modes themselves and i'm not sure i would care very much about the last two ones the last two points but an anti-dive function and automatic preload may be worth having i think and hell if you are spending that much for a bike, especially since for 2023 KTM raised the prices of both of these models by around 10%, it probably would be a pity to miss out on it, even if you don't think you'll use it. Not the best logic, but otherwise, if you're like me, you would just keep wondering what it would be like if you had it and when you could use it even just to play with. This is the first big difference between those two motorcycles, between S and R. The second thing is wheels that in the R are having 21 inch rims in the front and 18 inch rims in the rear, while in the S both are smaller and there's 19 inches in the front and 17 inches in the rear. Rims are spoked and tubeless in the R and cast alloy also tubeless in the S. And here for the S you may add spoked wheels in the bike's original rim sizes for a thousand euros or so. The same size as originals, just spoke. And in this whole point here, I'll include different tires, which on the R I've been riding were Bridgestone Battle Axe Adventure, and in the S version, they were Mitas, whatever you call it, Terra Force R, which I'll have a comment about when we'll be talking about how things actually feel. Now, what those two points mean is that along with the taller suspension and taller wheels in the R, this means different geometry. Not much on paper, but it turns out that you can feel it. And surprise, surprise all the way. These beautiful office chairs that you see in my videos are electric 7G 11s, which have every part adjustable to suit the most body type. So if you're considering a new office chair, check out my videos with them and also visit the website at powerseeds.eu. All right, now what are you getting in both and what only in the S and what only in the R in terms of tech and equipment? This may be important to see what you're paying for and how to plan your budget going for either of these beasts. And both come with the same awesome, I think, seven inch TFT display with great graphics, with great animations and explanations of what certain functions mean to you and to the bike as well. This is actually truly a fantastic system. You already have Bluetooth smartphone connectivity, both both have handguards as standard, both have riding modes in the form of street, sport, rain, and then off-road modes. Everyone comes with traction control, cornering LED lights incorporated already into the main lamp, a compartment for smartphone, as there's a USB outlet there too, and then there's a problem and a pity that both have to come with KTM's new indicators, which that doesn't work exactly uh, correctly. You can see how it behaved in my full reviews of the S and then R independently in both it simply didn't want to work properly and it's a known issue among the riders as well. There's no magical way of making it work. No, there is not, rather than uh, just doing everything very slowly. But with indicators doing things slowly, damn it, KTM, please come on. Let's give them a chance to react as there is hope, for example, because also as standard, there is Keyless Ignition and Fuel Cap, which I am a, personally a big fan of in general. And as a whole, this is called Race On. Raise on, always. So if you've come across this and wondered what in the world that could mean, it's simply kill a system in KTM and they've got to be there too. But aside from this, a center stand is included in another great thing, tire pressure monitoring system, which should, I believe, be in every single motorcycle nowadays. Having wrong tire pressure, especially too little, uh, can cause pretty, pretty bad situations, especially when it's wet. So beware there, KTM is taking care of us no matter what you're buying in terms of super adventure. And so this is it where we are with the most important features that are in both models. But there are six different elements installed or missing in either of the models. First difference in equipment is the seat, which both have, but in the S it's adjustable with two separate units, 
one for the rider and one for the passenger, while there is a one-piece fixed seat in the R version, which is also at the same time higher because it's at 88 centimeters in total. In the S, the rider sits at 85 centimeters and you can raise it to 87, which I found actually convenient. Somehow I felt better on the R, even though it was pretty tall for my height, 183 or 4 centimeters. But this is exciting and not scary and overwhelming tall, like for example on a Triumph Tiger 1200 Rally. And that was one. The second difference is windshield that is smaller in the R and larger in the S. Both are adjustable via the same system in a five and a half centimeter range. I strongly suggest that you take care and keep this system clean as otherwise it may get harder and harder to adjust the height with the knobs on the sides if dirt gets in between there. The third difference in equipment is that Super Adventure R comes with regular cruise control, while the S has by default an adaptive cruise control system with a radar mount in between the parts of this front lamp that you see right now there. This may allow you to follow a vehicle in front with the bike adjusting the speed along with it. And I'm a big fan of it in cars, not so much in motorcycles actually. There is a better use for a radar, I think, and I'll get to that later. But then there are different colors also. And recently, so from 2021 to at least 2023, the R was left in only one color configuration while the S was getting two different colors, actually less exciting ones, but whatever, that's for you guys to judge. This, I would say is pretty strange by the way, because it makes them look all pretty much the same. But whatever, even if you really want, you can either repaint or wrap your bike. And fifth difference here is that R comes with an aluminum full engine guard, while S only has a plastic cover, mostly doing its job from the front side of the engine. And the last one is crash bars that R comes straight with, and the S comes with nothing there instead. swiftly moving to what you can add to them, then there are crash bars on the list for the S model. In the R, you may switch to black bars instead of orange, that's as an option. An aluminum engine guard from the R is also there on the list for the S, so no worries here as well. And now, both models you may equip with heated grips and with the same heated seats for the rider and passenger and, for that matter, any other seat. As I understand that the mounts and space should be exactly the same in both bikes. That's good, I think. Both also can get a quick shifter added as an option. I'm not sure why at least the S, since it's supposed to be so much street oriented, doesn't come already with it, but that's on KTM to justify. I would go for it as it works really well up and down. There are two more things that usually are standard equipment or at least should be, but here you need to know that you need to order them and pay extra for them. And the first one is heel hold that may work on an incline to prevent the bikes from rolling when you're stationary and a thing called motor slip regulation that prevents the rear wheel from locking when you downshift too aggressively and would otherwise lose traction or just if you close the throttle on a surface slippery enough to cause the rear wheel to suddenly spin much less and in the end as well slide. And between us, I think that this definitely should be a standard equipment, not only at this level of pricing and this category, but I think it should go head to head with traction control in every single bike, I think. Uh, it's like 150 euros here, so well, I don't see the reason for not having it. So I don't know, come on. It's a safety feature, isn't it? But I'm glad that tire pressure monitoring system is always there, so let's not get too far. Three more significant things that you may add are automatic lubrication for the chain, which I would go for. Definitely, you may also buy it somewhere outside and get an aftermarket piece and install it. It's aftermarket piece anyway, just can't imagine. KTM is installing it. You can do it yourself for half the price from various brands. But it's definitely worth it and I myself had such a device and was doing a great job. The next one is interesting as it's a system of an adaptive brake light that flashes quickly like in cars when emergency braking is detected by the bike. This can be a really helpful thing for others around you to realize that you're braking hard. I like that. I like that KTM is coming out with those kinds of things. And the last one is a rally pack with an additional rally riding mode that allows you to separately select a traction control intervention and also separately throttle response. In addition to that, it also changes the way that the display looks after selecting this mode. 
nice idea with the visual aspect but if you're not going to play so much off the road i don't think I would go for it even despite it being 240 euros. What you cannot get is rear radar with blind spot monitoring that I feel would be probably a much more helpful feature than the front radar for adaptive cruise control. And also you cannot get shaft drive. Both of these bikes I wish were having it, but you know, uh, always some compromises and I would also recommend getting an aftermarket exhaust if you can and if you are allowed to and I'm not a fan of the Akropovich exhausts that are offered by KTM sort of from the factories they sometimes tend to sound very similarly to stock systems so paying a lot more than for other systems you may go with and getting less is mm. but with the V2 I would do whatever I could to get a proper exhaust on both of these bikes and they will sound insane and I get all excited just by thinking about that as you see, the equipment looks pretty decent and even the extras are priced rather fairly, I think. Even though some of them I feel should be there already, but okay. Now, the last and subjective part, because since I rode both versions that were dealer's bikes, I can tell you quite precisely how they both feel. And you should know that I first rode Super Adventure R as the S version was nowhere to be found throughout the whole year in the whole country, except for one and only place quite far away from where I uh, live. And I eventually went and got it, thanks to you guys, or thanks to you pushing me to do it. I wanted to try the R to get an idea on how the S should feel. And that was a big mistake, but it works for good, as otherwise I might not even consider the R. And okay, but what do I mean by all that? Of course, the R is taller and you can feel that I am 183, 184 centimeters tall. I could touch the ground on the R with both feet, but not flat with my heels up. You know what? I felt freaking great on it. The position so high from the ground, the sort of aggressive stance on the tall seat, this made me feel so much better and so much more in control comparing to how I felt on the S, with its seat initially three centimeters lower at 85 centimeters. Then having this in mind, I raised the seat to 87 centimeters, but I still didn't feel that good. And I'm not one of those who would willingly raise the seat, maybe just for a very, very long ride to ease uh, like the knee angle to feel more comfortable. But I'm not that tall and yet here this was making a difference for me. Perhaps swapping the seats or simply getting a taller one for the S could help. But then there is the taller suspension as well. Then there are different wheels and a bit changed geometry. And this resulted in two things. The off-road R was stable as a train at lower speeds and felt like one of the best bikes to ride in the city. I, I loved it so much that I felt the temptation to ride over whatever there was, cars roofs. It hasn't happened on any other motorcycle than this particular version of 1290 Super Adventure and a BMW R1250 GS, normal. But in a different sense, in a different form, sticking to pavement itself and rather riding too fast, too close to cars and too recklessly, that was, that was the result. In Super Adventure S, I felt more wobbly when getting in between the cars. I wasn't as confident and definitely, definitely there wasn't as much precision at low speeds as in the R. It felt like it was more resisting than the R and hesitating and I couldn't make it ride ideally straight at crawling speed. This is one thing. And the other thing is that, well, at higher speeds, the S was leaning more eagerly and it felt more precise to me. So on a twisty road, it would feel nicer to me and more nimble than the R, provided that the speeds are higher than, let's say, 40, 50, 60 kilometers per hour when you're making those turns. It's easier to start leaning into corners and staying there or even tightening the turns. The R suddenly feels very tall at those angles, but when you keep it relatively straight at lower speeds, it is a pure pleasure to ride, to control and maneuver around. This is very interesting and, and actually it was super freaking surprising to me. Aromatically, the R should feel much more like at home when off-roading as well, where precision may matter. It should matter as much as in uh, tight traffic. But then obviously, if you stop or try to push it, move it around the garage, you will realize that it's taller, that the weight is higher, and it's harder to move around than the S. But I bet that this is probably not the most important thing to many of us, unless you need to support yourself on top of some rat when off-roading, then it does matter how much weight it is up and how tall the bike is. But then if you are supposed to fall since you are too short, 
you will fall anyways. And I thought that the S would do everything better on the tarmac, but I feel it didn't do that. I need to mention also that the S had undergone a process of tightening this um, thing there in the middle of the handlebar, right? what the, I always forget what the name of it is, after KTM's official recommendation. I'm not sure if the R had it done or came already with it. The behavior of the S might have been affected by it as its handlebar felt definitely, definitely harder to turn. And this also might have caused the struggle, at least a part of it, uh, that I was experiencing. It might have, but who knows, maybe not. And now, if it's the new KTM recommendation, it means that this characteristic is there to stay. I don't know why, probably to prevent the wobbly behavior at higher speeds, which it makes sense, but if it's impacting the low speed control, Maybe they've gone too far, if that's how it actually was supposed to be. I just know that they were, that the dealers were asked to do it on the at least S versions. One more thing was grip of the rear tire, which in the R was very, very good. And I was repeatedly having the bike lift its front wheel in a few gears on those Bridgestone tires, while the S version on Mitas was, let's put it this way, mostly all over the place, drifting and not even once trying to lift its wheel. And of course, I much prefer what the R was doing. It was a brand new bike with around 200 kilometers on the clock, while the S was having around 6,000 kilometers on it. Could this have been a factor? Maybe, but maybe not, as the tire definitely wasn't flat uh, in the S version. So I don't think there was any reason for it to, to, to behave so much differently. That's why it was all so shocking to me. And that's why I believe that all of you who think that may have a preference towards a certain version, especially towards the S version, like I had before, that all those should also try the R. Maybe not if you're very short and plan on touring at high speeds at all times, but other than that, take an R for a spin, as I myself remember my ride on it as one of the most exciting and more exciting and more enjoyable than on the S, thanks to the low speed control that this version was providing. The prices are in the same range with the R, a model being less than 4% more expensive here than the S. Definitely, definitely try them out. The engine is amazing. To me, it is definitely the best engine in the whole category. The most fun at any RPM. That's what I mean here. But try both models yourself to make sure that you are going with the best option for yourself. And remember that accessories like a windshield or a lower seat that you may always get for the R if that's where you would be heading. If you want to know more about all other aspects than just differences between the two, please do watch my review of both bikes. See you there and have a good one. Bye.